All right, welcome to another edition of Painting of the Week. This week's painting was a special request, but I also wanted to do it just to kind of dissolve a lot of the... I don't know. You look up this painting, which is, of course, recognized by everyone. It's Da Vinci's Last Supper. And there's so much stuff about, you know, different theories and secret meanings hidden in the painting, and those are interesting. They're probably not true. <laughs> and I think sometimes we forget about... Uh, the significance of the painting itself, and that's really why I wanted to talk about it this week. Da Vinci, and this is of course a Renaissance piece of art, painted this between 1495 and 1498. And what a lot of people don't realize is how big it is. Um, it's actually 15 feet, uh, 15 feet wide by 29 feet long, and it's it's not in a museum. It's it's in a church. Here's a picture of uh, actually what it looks like if you were to go see it. One thing that people always get wrong about this painting is they say that it's a fresco. And just in case you don't know, a fresco is essentially just a, a piece of art that's painted on wet plaster. But da Vinci didn't paint this on wet plaster. The plaster was, um, it was already a dry wall, so it's not a true fresco. Um, and the reason da Vinci didn't want to do a fresco was because you can't modify that. You can't modify a fresco as you paint. So instead, he decided to use a sealed stone wall that had been sealed with a layer of pitch, which is a type of resin, gesso, which is white paint, um, or a white kind of chalky substance that's mixed with gypsum, which is a mineral, or calcium sulfate dihydrate for you chemists out there, and then mastic, which is another type of plant resin. And then, on top of that sealed wall, he actually painted the Last Supper with tempera, which is like a egg yolk based substance. And unfortunately, because of the method and the different types of media that were used uh, in painting the Last Supper, the piece really began to deteriorate as soon as a few years after da Vinci had already painted it. And it's gone through several rounds of uh, extensive restoration and is still pretty faded if you, um, if you ever get a chance to see it. So what it depicts, I think everybody understands that, it's the reaction that's given by each apostle when Jesus reveals to them that one of the apostles would betray him. And we'll just go through, starting off on the left and then working our way to the right, who each of the, uh, the individual figures are. Furthest to the left is Bartholomew. Next to him is James, son of Elpheus, and Andrew. And these three men all appear to be surprised. Next to Andrew is Judas Iscariot, then Peter, and then John. They form the next group of three. Judas is the one wearing green and blue, and he's sort of off to the side. He's withdrawn, taken back by Jesus suddenly revealing his plan. He's also holding a small bag in his right hand, which could mean two things, either um, as a symbol of the silver that was given to him as a payment for betraying Jesus, or it could be a reference to him as one of the... He was actually the treasurer of the 12 disciples. Peter who's next to Judas looks angry, and he's holding a knife that's pointed away from Jesus, which is probably meant to foreshadow his violent reaction in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus was arrested, when Peter uh, cut off one of the guard's ears, and then Jesus restored it. And then the youngest apostle, John, who those of you who have read the Da Vinci Code probably think is Mary Magdalene, um, is appearing to swoon almost. Then, of course, is Jesus in the center, and then the next group of three is the Apostle Thomas, James, the son of Zebedee, and then Philip. Thomas appears to be the most upset of the three, whereas James just looks stunned with his arms in the air. Philip appears to be uh, requesting some sort of explanation. And then the last group of three is Matthew, Jude Thaddeus, which is the one apostle everyone always forgets, and then Simon the Zealot. Both Jude and Matthew are actually turned toward Simon, perhaps maybe trying to figure out if he has some sort of explanation for their questions. Notice that the lighting and the angles all draw attention to Jesus, whose head is um, what you would call a vanishing point. And um, if you've never taken an art history class or an uh, art appreciation course before, the vanishing point is essentially just, um, in perspective painting, the point in which parallel lines that aren't parallel to the image plane appear to converge. So the best example I can think of that would be 
like this, railroad tracks, you know they're parallel, but in the distance they appear to converge on one another. And that kind of perspective um, was incorporated into art by some of the Renaissance masters, including da Vinci. The painting also uh, contains several references to the number three, which embodies that Christian ideal of the Holy Trinity. The apostles are all sitting in groups of three. There's three windows behind Jesus, and uh, the shape of Jesus actually is said to resemble a triangle. And of course, the painting also includes several direct biblical references, um, particularly Luke chapter 22, verse 21, and yet behold, the hand of the one who is to betray me is on the table. And notice Judas is actually the only one who's leaning with his um, arm on the table. And then there's another reference to Matthew chapter 26, verse 23. He who has dipped his hand into the dish with me is the one who will betray me. And notice that Judas is sort of unwittingly reaching toward the exact same dish that Jesus is reaching for with his right hand. It's a very interesting painting, one of the most widely recognized religious paintings, an example of Renaissance paintings. I hope you've enjoyed it. Have a great week, everybody. We'll see you again next week.